For our final presentation, we are delighted to welcome our own, very own Bethan Rees. Bethan has been working with Agent House since she was in primary school, and she's been part of Teenage History Club, um, creating the collections and Pride projects since the start. She's going to be presented about she's going to be presenting about asexuality and often overlooked part of LGBTQ plus history. After the presentation, Bethan will be answering questions, so please remember to type your questions in the Q and A box. Over to Bethan. Thank you, Mia. I'll just quickly get myself set up. Can you see that sl slideshow okay? Yeah, we can. Fab. So, hi everyone. Thank you so much for coming along today. I'm Bethan, as mentioned earlier, and I use she, her pronouns, and I have the challenge of concluding today's event and coming, off, um, coming after hours of absolutely incredible presentations. I have thoroughly enjoyed them all today, and I hope I can be along the same standard. As mentioned before, I am a long-time member of Ancient House's Teenage History Club, and I was a part of the group that curated the exhibition Pride to the People Helping History Out of the Closet and we ran tours and various events, including this one, surrounding LGBT plus history. When we were creating the content, one thing that we wanted to make sure was that we included as many identities as possible, including asexuality. I myself am asexual and aromantic, and I really wanted to learn more about asexual history. And today I'm here to give you a fun, light-hearted, hopefully sort of comedic introduction into asexuality and asexual history. Hopefully it should be a nice way to end the day. I mean, a lot of you might have been here all day and might be feeling a little bit Zoom fatigued. So hopefully this should be a good fun way to end it. And I'd like to start off by saying that this is not the self-reproductive amoeba type of asexual. And I am afraid that you are at the wrong talk if you are looking for that. I'm talking asexual as a series of identities. So grab a cup of tea, a bit of cake or pie or something because I'm going to take you on a journey and show you that, yes, asexuality does exist. So, let's start at the basics for those of you who don't know. What is asexuality? And no, it's not being sexually attracted to the letter A. As helpful as the letter it is, it's only worth one point in Scrabble. Asexuality basically means the lack of sexual attraction to any gender. This doesn't necessarily mean that an asexual or ace person, for sure, doesn't have sex. Some may be repulsed to it, but there are still, still those who enjoy getting it on, if you know what I mean. Me, I'm the kind that still feels ever so slightly awkward watching sex scenes in films. Asexuality is often referred to as a spectrum because of the different identities it entails such as demisexual, only having sexual attraction in a close relationship, and grey ace, only feeling sexual attraction in some instances. Ace people can still be romantically attracted to people, but some ace people are also aromantic, which, as you can probably guess, is when you don't have a romantic attraction to any gender. So, now that I've given you a little bit of a crash course in what asexuality is, it's time to delve into the history and hop back to meet a man known as William Pitt the Younger. Born on the 28th of May 1759 into a highly political family, William Pitt the Younger went on to be the youngest Prime Minister at the age of 24. This is not to be confused with William Pitt the Elder, who was also a Prime Minister, but older, and also his dad. He started studying at Cambridge just before he turned 14. And obviously, I know the educational system was different then, but it feels weird thinking about him going to Cambridge, this highly prestigious university, at just 14. When meanwhile, when I was 14, and I'm sure some of you will relate to us, I was spouting absolute rubbish on Facebook. My memories, absolute nightmare. I mean, come on, he was literally writing letters to his father, his father in fluent Latin. 
I mean, yes, I know nowadays literally any kid with access to Google Translate, even if it's wildly inaccurate, can do that too. But doing it from your own knowledge and fluently is one heck of a flex. Anyway, Pitts was regarded by some to be one of the greatest prime ministers, uh, of course, subject to opinion. He was commonly known not to be attracted to women, which led to some satire, including this satirical verse. Tis true indeed, we oft abuse him because he bends to no man, but slander's self does not accuse him of stiffness to a woman. Yep, it's exactly what you're thinking. The implication of this is essentially a dick joke. Classy. He was known to have close relationships with men, with one such relationship being compared to that of James I and the Duke of Buckingham, i.e. looks very gay. However, he also didn't have any sexual relationships with these men, so that gives a basis for some, including me, to think that he might be homoromantic, but asexual. And interestingly enough, it turns out that William Pitt the Younger is actually an ancestor of mine. I'm a descendant of a fellow ace. Makes sense, really. There has also been evidence of early social movements that could be considered asexual or wider LGBT plus movements. For example, the spinster movement of the late 1800s. This was a big feminist movement that wanted to push against the ideas that men set of what a woman was supposed to be in society. The spinster movement in particular focused a lot around sex and not marrying, which at the time was a very radical idea. Some ideas were even anti-sex as a whole. However, they managed to successfully push, push for the raising of the age of consent in America and England. Historians have really considered this movement to be LGBT plus in some way, including wondering if it was highly asexual. Around this time, in 1918, 1969, oh, 1869, third time lucky, Carl Maria Kurt Bernie coined the all familiar terms homosexual and heterosexual. However, with this, he also coined the term monosexual. The definition? People who only masturbate. I mean, close, I guess, pretty specific, but close. And now jumping forward to 1948, when another name was given to us, Dr. Albert Kinsey included those with no sociosexual contacts or rea reactions on the Kinsey scale in a di distinct category known as X. I mean, it definitely stands out there as the only number letter in a scale of numbers. Imagine if we'd stuck with that instead of asexual. I mean, think of all the pop culture jokes, the X-Men, the X-Factor. Ah, oh, that's a very lost opportunity there. Asexual activism and feminism still continued to go hand in hand, almost a century after the spinster movement. In 1972, Lisa Orlando wrote an essay known as the Asexual Manifesto. Disillusioned by feminist narratives at the time, she looked at asexuality not so much as an identity, but as she describes, a commitment to defy and ultimately to destroy the baseless concepts surrounding both sex and relationships which support and perpetuate the patriarchy. She also stated, this manifesto is not the last word on asexuality, it is only a beginning. And she was right! Not only are you hopefully listening to me right now, discussion only continued to rise and the idea of asexuality as an identity became more clear. On the 17th of May, 1997, Zoe O'Reilly wrote an article for an online magazine, and this article was called My Life as an Amoeba. That's right, there was asexuality content on the internet before Tumblr! Take that, exclusionists! Anyway, it's a really interesting article about identifying as asexual in the 1990s, which, thanks to the wonderful Wayback Machine, is still online and able to be read. Don't you just love Internet Archive? She explains her view. I find that being devoid of sexuality makes my life a lot easier. By not having a significant other, I am following Forel's philosophy of simplify, simplify, simplify. One less birthday to remember, less food to buy, and no one forcing me to place someone besides myself first on my list. 
I mean, that's one way to look at it. But from a personal perspective, I would probably still end up replacing that additional food spending with cats or houseplants. So I'll probably be broke either way, to be honest. This article led to what some regard as the first online asexual community, as asexual people really identified with what O'Reilly was saying. The early 2000s led to online asexual communities springing up and becoming more common. The first was Haven for the Human Amoeba, an email list that was run through Yahoo. And in March 2001, David J set up the community now more commonly known as the Asexual Visibility and Education Network, or AVEN for short, which is probably now the most well-known asexuality advocacy group. I think it is really important for me to state here that although a lot of organising did happen online, it is totally inaccurate to state that asexuality is an internet orientation. I mean, if you were listening to the first part of my presentation, you'll, you'll see it's been around a while. As the 2000s went on and communities like Avon grew, asexual people became more recognised and developed the community. And the symbolism of cake came in. Basically, when the online forums for Aven started, members liked to welcome new users with cake, with the idea that cake was better than sex. And which I agree. Apparently, there's even been controversy between cake and pie being better. Now, I don't know about you, but I love the idea of this of all things being a massive debate. Who needs sex when you can argue about desserts? In 2005, the unofficial symbol of the black ace ring was suggested, with people wearing a black ring on the middle finger of their right hand to show that they were asexual, and, the white, and a white ring on the left middle finger for aromantics followed, and this is still prevalent today. And in 2010, our pride flag was created. Avon held a competition on their forum for people to submit designs for an asexual pride flag. The members then voted on the design, and this was the winning design. The colours used were a part of the Avon logo, but also, like other pride flags, have their own meanings. The black stripe represents asexuality, the grey stripe represents grey aces and demisexuals, the white stripe represents non-asexual partners and allies, and the purple stripe represents community. Alongside this, in 2010, the very first Asexual Awareness Week, now more commonly known as Ace Week, was held, and this runs at the end of October every year. Nowadays, although there is more to be done, especially when it comes to exclusionary attitudes, asexual people are definitely more recognised, and asexuality is starting to be included more in LGBT plus campaigns. Avon regularly march at some Pride events, including London Pride. At London Pride 2019, the first asexual bar event was held, known as the Ace of Clubs, which also gives further proof that asexuals are incredible at naming things. We have activists like Yasmin Benoit, an asexual activist and model, making waves, breaking stereotypes and providing incredible visibility. And on the 31st of January this year, literally the day before LGBT plus history month began, an International Asexuality Day was announced, and the first ever one will be held on the 6th of April this year. All of that is pretty ace, huh? That is a terrible pun, I am so sorry, but I have to do that somewhere. I would like to finish this by talking a little bit about my experiences as an Aero Ace person. It's interesting looking back at myself growing up from an asexual and aromantic lens, and looking back, I'm pretty sure any desire I had for a relationship growing up was totally forced to fit in with people around me and I never really fantasised about it. I'm autistic and unfortunately growing up as that one autistic kid, I don't know if any of you watching can relate, people really loved to make fun of me. I had some people decide to think it was a really great idea to ask me out as a joke. Although it really did upset me at the time because you know that is a very cruel thing to do, I never really knew why I said yes in the first place, and it didn't really affect me soon after. I've never felt I was missing out by not finding things or people sexually attractive, or by not being in a romantic relationship. 
I actually stumbled upon the term asexual at about 15 or so and immediately thought, oh my God, that's me. I'm 20 now and I still don't feel any different. When it came to coming out, I found that I've always really had to explain what it was, but in recent years, probably because awareness seems to have improved a little bit, it's not been so much as necessary. The time I felt the most validated in everyday life was when a group of friends and I were having a little conversation about relationships, and I mentioned I wasn't really attracted to anyone. Somebody immediately responded, there's a word for that, right? Asexual. And I was able to come out with these. Going to Pride events for the first time in 2019 was also an amazing experience. Of course, I have heard of a small number of people in the LGBT plus community being very excluding of ace people, but I felt really, really welcome at every Pride. And it was wonderful to see loads of other ace people. One of my fondest memories was walking up to Trafalgar Square for London Pride and seeing somebody right across the road with a big asexual flag sticking out of their bag. They spotted me wearing mine from across the road and waved. And above all, I'm happy with who I am. And that's the main thing, right? That's all I have for you. And before we do go to questions, though, I'd really like to thank you for listening. I hope I've made you laugh at times. I mean, my humour is pretty questionable at the best of times, so i will be really chuffed if I did. But above all, I really hope you've learned something from me today. I've really enjoyed researching this and I hope you've enjoyed learning about it. And this is definitely a very personal moment for me because I, as you all have known, as I've mentioned, I've basically grown up around Ancient House Museum and I'm really honoured to be speaking at an event hosted by them and with the club that I've grown up around and done so many things I never thought I could do. So thank you so much. Thank you, Bethan. That was an amazing pres presentation. Thank you. Especially as an asexual person myself, I just, your humour was fantastic and it was, it was great. Well done. Thank you. you. Ready for questions? Indeed. So, first question is, do you think there is a risk of mid-queering asexual figures from the past as gay? Sorry, can you repeat that? I might open the Q&A box so I can follow if that's okay. Okay. Do you think there is a risk of mid-queering asexual figures from the past as gay? I've not actually thought about this and I think with any of them there's a whole load of things that you have to consider when you look at them and I'm not 100% sure on this. Ooh. The thing is, it is quite difficult because it's so hidden and very much brushed off and it takes kind of a lot to kind of think if they could have potentially been asexual or or not, but I'm not actually too sure on this, apologies. I think you answered that really well. Anyway, um, next question. Are there any good representations of ace people in films, books, pop, pop culture, etc., or any really bad representation? There is not a lot of representation at all. I have heard, I don't watch Riverdale, um, but apparently there was a character in there who was asexual, but the creators actually removed their asexuality when they did the when they did the TV adaptation. And I know there's been a lot of complaints around that. Um, I hear I hear that sex education has an asexual character and really good discussion around asexuality. I hear Bojack Horseman has a similar load as well. And I haven't read this book yet, but it is on my shelf. I've been meaning to read it for ages, but there is a young adult book by Alice Oseman. I don't know if you've heard of the um, Heartstopper series, but she actually wrote a book called Loveless and oh, it's been on my list to read for ages, but that has an asexual and aromantic lead character. That sounds amazing. And I, I, see, I see that has also been mentioned in the chat. The next questions are, how far are the symbols vital for finding each other? Mm. 
I'd say it's very much if you're in the known, you can pick up the other things. It's sort of like if you know of a flag, a specific flag, and you see someone else with it, um, you'll immediately know. Obviously, as I mentioned before, social media and the internet has been a really big point big way of asexual people finding each other and I think no having these little subtle symbols would also be a very a very good way of finding each other I've personally found that I've found other asexual people through actually talking I tend to just say oh I'm asexual and sometimes I respond oh me too so it's generally like a whole mutual kind of conversation if that makes sense thank you I think we have one more question Oh, no, we have no more questions so far. If there's any more questions, feel free to pop them in the chat. Oh, we've got a... Could you talk a bit about how coming out as asexual intersected with your artistic identity too? Was it easier or harder? Oh, that's really interesting. Um, I like to joke because of this that I am described by a lot of A's. Um, I think, I know there is a lot of interesting correlations around being queer in some way and being autistic. Um, I think that is an unfortunate, I feel like I've heard that there is a bit of a stereotype around autistics being asexual. I don't know where I've heard about that, but I think, ooh, in terms of an intersexual thing, I found that there's most, uh, quite a few of the other asexual people that I've met have also been autistic in some way. So I think it's definitely... Ooh, I'm sorry, I'm always the best at answering questions. <laughs> um, generally, I don't think it's really had too much an effect, but in terms of meeting other asexual people, some of them have, quite a lot of them that I have met have also been autistic, so it's definitely a little bit of connection there, but generally it has been a little bit separated, and I found that I've always had to explain the asexuality more, because it's not as well known, and yeah, I think there is a lot of really interesting discussions to be had about autistic identities and LGBT plus identities. Thank you, Beth, and that was an awesome answer. Once again. I think that is all the questions, unless there's a few um, more. If you just have a little look in the chat and read out some of the comments, there is, there's one question lurking in there as well. Ah, okay, thank you. There's one question. Missed the start of this pre presentation as I thought it started at 5 p.m. How much did I miss um, and where I, can I see it as recording? Um, from what I know, Ancient House is going to be putting this up on the YouTube channel. Um, I think we just had a bit of a thing with timings and it did start a little bit earlier. So huge apologies there. Um, I'm not 100% sure on all of the timings or where you might have started in, but basically... I gave a little bit of a crash course as to what asexuality is. So it is a, um, it's basically when somebody doesn't have, isn't attracted to any gender sexually. And I kind of did a little bit of a crash course of that. Then I talked a little bit about William Pitt the Younger, who was the youngest prime minister. And because he had no real attraction or any relationships with women and no sexual relationships with men we wonder that we might he might be homo romantic but also asexual so that's a story that we actually covered in some of the ancient house lgbt plus history projects um then i kind of went and just and kind of looked at asexuality through time so the spinster movement um the coining of the term monosexual that came at the same time as homosexual and heterosexual um when we were no asexuality was known as an x on the kinsey scale and kind of development of asexual as an identity through the internet and other means so it will be uploaded onto youtube and i think more details will come on the ancient house social media if that's correct um if i can uh 
interject here for a moment, Bethan. Please do. Um, everybody who has signed up for the uh, the event um, will receive by the beginning of March uh, links to all of the presentations which have been uploaded. We need a little bit of time because we're going to subtitle the ones that we didn't have a chance to subtitle before just to make them as accessible as possible, but it will come straight to your email address. Okay, we have, we have a few more comments in the chat. Great presentation, Bethan. Very entertaining and funny from Robin. Um, Nick says, this was so amazing. If you ever fancy going on tour, we'd love to have you at our LGBTQ plus youth groups while we are still online. Um, another one from Nick. I've learned so much. This is great. Um, brilliant. I, I'm glad we can rewatch all of these and share with others. Um, Shan says again, amazing summary. Thanks a lot, Bethan. We'll look out for the upload. Thanks, Melissa. I think another question's come through in the Q&A box. Did you hear anything about ace identities in school? Oh no, this is where a lot of people are saying there needs to be discussion about asexual identities in school. I heard nothing about asexuality and I think this is where the internet comes in as a really powerful tool for people to find their identities because obviously with things around LGBT plus education and especially of asexuality being often very overlooked in mainstream LGBT plus culture. Um, it doesn't really get spoken about. And for quite a while, I was the only ace person I knew. So I think it definitely needs to be spoken about. And especially so many people growing up have felt that they're broken for not experiencing sexual attraction or even being kind of almost forced into it um it definitely needs to be spoken about but I didn't hear anything at all I think asexuality is very um like underrepresented in school as well another question would you say there are any particular problems that ace people come up against from society what works needs to be done it's generally more so of a misunderstanding. Like people will hear the word asexual and be immediately confused and not really knowing what it means or even just calling them amoebas, which we're not. We're definitely more than one cell of an organism. Um, and also within like a very minority, uh, very much a minority of the LGBT plus community, um, they like to, there's some people who believe that ace people are straight people trying to infiltrate the community quote unquote and they are generally very rude i've heard of people being added to very rude group chats and it's generally just a you don't belong here and it's what i think needs to be done is the act of including ace people in the community and saying that we have been by your side the whole time I mean, there has been things done to show that we are part of the community. I mean, our flag is literally flown up outside the Stonewall building now. So, yeah, it's just very much educating and raising awareness and raising voices. And with, in, with the first International Asexuality Day coming up, hopefully that can make a difference to a lot of people. Thank you, Beth. I don't think at the moment there are any more questions. Okay. But there might be a few more coming through. I really appreciate it all. We've had some very interesting conversations. It's been really interesting listening to your talk. Thank you. And thank you all for all of your support and all of your really interesting questions. It's been an absolute honour and I really appreciate it. And thank you to the guys at Teenage History Club for having me. It's obviously, I love being with them and it really meant the world to me to come in and see that they'd actually chose me. So it really meant a lot. So thank you so much, guys. Thank you, Bethan. I, I love the presentation. Uh, gave me lots lots of laughs um uh, thank you so much um and we now pass over to nance for uh closing remarks well thank you for that 
truly incredible presentation. I don't think I've laughed so hard in a very long time. Um, so on behalf of Teenage History Club, we would like to thank the Outing the Past Committee, all of our wonderful speakers and Kick the Dust, a National Lottery Heritage Fund project for enabling us to offer this conference today. If you'd like to find out about more events in LGBT History Month, we will post the link in the chat. And if you'd like to find out more about our work, please check out our YouTube Queer History playlist, which we are also putting in the chat. For now, we say a massive thank you for attending and good night. <laughs>